as teachers, we have to remember that each student is really coming to you, asking you, what am I, what am I good at? Can you find it for me and help me do it even better? That's maximize that's how, it, maximize the gift. Yeah, yeah. That's how I approach my entire teaching career now is just help them maximize the gift, help them find out what that is. And, and you know, at the end of the day, a lot of people try to quit music is because no one's ever told them that they're good at it. Everyone is good at music. Our guest today has his hands on all things music. Literally, he's a pianist, keyboardist, vocalist, and a recording artist. He's also a gifted songwriter with an incredible resume and range of talent. He's a composer of film scores and an arranger in the genres of jazz, rock, classical, and pop, to name a few. His brand new single, Just Fine, featuring Sarah Rogers and Hayden Fogel, is out now. Welcome to the show, my friend and truly a one-of-a-kind musician, Mark Marinaccio. Hey, Mike. What's I going on, you, brother? I, I'm i proud to be probably the uh, the one guest you've had with a last name as difficult to say as yours. Not, You know what? It's, it's really cool that you bring that up because our names actually end in the CCIO. Mm-hmm. And you are definitely the only person I know that has that same ending. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've had people on with some difficult to say names, but it's, of course, it's nice that I know you and I don't have to worry about butchering it. But I mm-hmm. think you actually, um, it's interesting because De Chocho is how my family's always said our name and my family is directly from Italy. So I've always gone with that. But you guys articulate that CCIO is Chio, not Chio, correct? It's how it was always said, but it's it's not. When I go to Italy and I hand them that, my credit card, they say, oh, Signore Marinaccio. And okay, I like it. Okay, beautiful. I like it that way. All right. So now I know that we are kind of doing it the right way. This is it. The interview you can are. end right now. I'm fulfilled. Yes. Um, my grandparents, God bless them. My dad, God bless them. Um, no longer with us. But uh, it was always something that I wanted an answer on. And it was like insulting to ask them because of course they're going to be like, yeah, we're saying it the right way. But when I heard it said a little bit different, uh, you always wonder. And the fact let's that just, you're in Italy. Let's I just do 58 it. more minutes of this. Why don't we do that? Let's do that. Forget, forget the rest of it. <laughs> uh, guys, thank you so much for tuning in on YouTube. And if you're tuning in on Apple, Spotify, wherever you guys are listening right now, you can connect with Mark on Instagram, Facebook. He's on YouTube. We're going to get to his new song in a couple minutes here. All the links are clickable in the show notes, keeping it super easy for you guys to connect with Mark, myself, and uh, check out the music video as well. So um, I want you to know, Mark, when I was preparing for this interview, I'm reflecting back on how long we've actually known each other and like back to when we first met. And it's crazy to think that was actually over 20 years ago, not to make us both seem older than we are, but it goes all the way back to our high school band days. And uh, you were, of course, friends with my brother. So hanging out with Wally. Um, and, and all the, but all of our buddies from, from West Seneca West, uh, so cool, but it's been a a wild ride. So here's what I'd like to do is actually hop in the DeLorean with you for a moment and go all the way back to even before when we met back in high school, take us to the early days of when you actually first played piano and that first moment when you fell in love with it. Can you share that moment? And then also like where that musical influence came from? You know, it's funny. I don't know if anybody's ever asked me, when did you first fall in love with it? But I remember standing in my living room and my mom coming down the steps and saying, hey, uh, your uncle wants to know if you want to take piano lessons from from him. And probably unlike any other decision I've ever made in my life, I just I just looked at her and said, yes, and then went back to whatever I was doing. There was no hesitation. I never thought a second about it, and the rest is kind of history. Um, fortunately for me, I, you know, I had a I had a teacher who, you know, was um, related to me, familiar to me, and he was actually a very young uncle. Um, we're only a ten years apart in age, and it was kind of unstructured and fun, and he let me be me, and um, I learned to love music before I learned to play music. So that's really important, and, and I, I obviously. That's something I uh, remember to incorporate into my style of education, you know, especially if you're teaching young kids, that's, you know, just uh, make them love it first and then worry about all the nomenclature later. It's supposed to be fun. 
I mean, music yeah. is fun. It, it's the way it makes you yeah. feel. It's of course it's notes on a page and it's, you know, the way that you articulate it and get into some of the theory. It's, it's a, it's a language. It literally is a language, but aside from all that, it's people c- coming together, connecting it, I love that it's a universal language. You were already falling in love with music before that. And then did you say it was your grandfather played and uh, offered my, music lessons? Uh, my, my mom's brother. She's my uncle. Oh, your uncle. Okay. So your yeah. uncle had, had played um, and took an interest like, hey, if Mark wants to check this out. So um, was he coming over? Because I remember when back in the day when I'd go over to your parents' house, you had the piano in the living room. Is that where you were taking lessons like when you were, what, six years old? No, but. When I, well, I was six when I started, but my uncle, mm-hmm. like I said, was only 10 years older than me. So he was a teenager and he lived with my grandmother still. So I would go to her house and my other cousins would be taking lessons upstairs in the, in the piano room. And we, you know, we, while we would wait for our lessons, she would, she would force feed us downstairs. It was, a, it was a whole afternoon. It was yeah, quite lovely. That's amazing, <laughs> man. Yeah. And then from there, you later t- took an interest in, uh, on the saxophone. You're amazing at that. I could play a whole clip of you doing that if I have one. Um, but, you know, no, I got to experience no you doing... No such exists. <laughs> no such... But, yeah, you... Um, shout out to your Thank cousin you. Tom, who's also great on the saxophone. And you guys have a musical family. Uh, certainly, you got plenty of singers in your family to round it out. You got your cousin Rocco who plays bass. So it's mm-hmm. definitely a musical group you got, um, musical family. But when did you start to enjoy saxophone or at least taking an interest for lessons? That was really just um, that was really just a public school thing. I started playing in fourth grade and played all the way through high school and played a little bit in a band in college. But um, you know, once I hit about nineteen years old, I I I didn't have time for it anymore. Um, it's not that I uh, I don't like it. Um, I certainly I love the saxophone. I love every instrument because. Um, it's just another color with which to paint. So, you know, as a composer and, and an arranger and an orchestrator and a, and a producer, it's good to know a little bit about each instrument. And um, as somebody who's written hundreds and hundreds of uh, horn charts and string quartet, you know, type arrangements in my life, it's good to, you know, pick the saxophone up. And before you hand the music to somebody else, to make sure that it's playable. So that's just, you know, obviously a little arranger trick, you know, you get, you have to know the instruments you're writing for, but as far as, um, technique, um, that's all gone now. <laughs> really? You think if you picked up a saxophone right now, you think you would, you wouldn't be as, uh, comfortable as, you know, obviously if you're practicing every day, there's going to be that, that right, you're right. Not even thinking mean, about playing, but do you, you really think if you had to play a song that you played a bunch back in the day it would it would be kind oh, of no, struggle that, right now no 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 that would come that would come back right away yeah um it's just you know we all have musicians we look up to and i would i probably wouldn't take a saxophone out of its case if i was in the room with let's say my my cousin tom who's yeah you know, a superior saxophonist my thing is more the keyboard uh-huh. voice the arranging thing really the last five ten years i've i've really exclusively gotten into um you know, part writing and, and producing. Right. I just love, As a composer. I love, yeah. I love giving people a role and you know, finding mm. a, finding a place for them that makes them shine. It's more, it's a little bit of a head coach. Like you get to play the game too. It's kind of like a quarterback. You play the game, but you're also yeah. making sure you're delivering, you're delivering it uh, to everyone on the team to set them up for success as well. Now, Playing the keyboard, my daughter, by the way, who's six years old, just started Isabel. I got her her first keyboard that's right over here. Um, and she's kind of just taking some lessons after school. And I'm excited about that because I know personally as a musician, I'm a, you know, as you know, I'm a drummer. Uh, some people tuning in maybe heard me say that before. The one thing about that is I love the drums, but I could never, when I was in band practice, tell our bass player or guitarist, hey, we're in the key of C or whatever, and it's going to go C, D, A, B. And then there's, you know, I had to hum it and I had to sound silly. And a lot of times by the time I did that, they were already on to the next idea. Um, and I always have these songs in my head. So it's super important for people to have, to be able to uh, understand notes on the keyboard. Right. And it, all songs start from there. So saxophone, if you wanted to tell a saxophonist how to get somewhere, um, in a song, you can show it, you can demonstrate on the keyboard. So would you recommend if there's parents right now or kids or someone who's maybe they could be 
40 years old and they're like, I want to start an instrument. Everybody, um, would you point I, them in the direction of the keyboard for that purpose? I, I, everyone should start with the piano and voice. Um, it's something yeah. anybody can do. Mm -hmm. uh, sing and play the piano and you can do pretty much anything after that. You know, some people might disagree, but I, I don't yeah. know a single uh, a guitarist whose life wasn't made better by also knowing how to play the piano or, or a single you know, wind player or drummer or really anybody who, who's, whose musical career wasn't enriched by knowing how to get their way around a piano. So absolutely. Kudos. It's like I said, it's a language. Yeah, it's like a language uh, situation. And, and that's helping you with all the words and putting the sentences together. And if you understand how that works, then you're on a different instrument. You you can just get along so much better. You you like hear the next note. You can go to the keyboard. You can hit it. Yes, that is the third, or that's the fifth, or whatever. That's kind of missing a missing piece in your head. You can demonstrate it, which is really really cool. Um, talk really quick up to again same situation. Instead of saying hey, the piano and voice is a great place to start. Obviously, when you get to a high level of being a, a musician and a talented one, I think part of that, there's some natural gifts that we all get from God. Some people are just better talented drummers or piano players or whatever it might be. Some people are great behind the camera, whatever their art and craft may be in the world. Um, there's that natural gift, but there's also the hours and hours and hours that you've practiced saxophone, keyboard, voice over and over doing composing. But a lot of times people get discouraged and it's usually in the first couple months to the maybe the first year if they even get that far because it takes so much practice. Can you help out someone who may be struggling and, and they're just like they put the instrument down because they give up? How can you help someone get through? I know as like your music teacher side right now, what would you tell a kid who's just like, I think I'm going to give it up. But you see something on them in that kid. What would you well, tell as, them? as a music teacher? um, you know, that's something, that's something we see every day. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, in, in one, in, I think what, what a lot of kids who don't want to do it for much longer, um, uh, the reason they want to, the reason they want to quit is because they've run into some obstacle that seems a little too difficult for them. And I think, I think if we teach them in a way, um, which sort of like sort of punitively, I don't, I don't think that that's fun. Um, there were times in my life, as crazy as this may sound, that I wanted to quit music. You know, I probably happened when I was about 14. And then again, when I was about 20. Um, and maybe even after that, at a, at a certain point or two. But um, I just kept reminding myself, what got me into this in the first place? Um and I decided to double down on, on that. We don't have to be, as musicians, good at everything. Um, you know, I love the music of all different composers, but just because, I mean, I'll be honest with you, when I was in college, there was a certain Bach piece, you know, J.S. Bach piece that was very difficult for me to tackle. And the way I was spoken to by some people who shall remain nameless made me feel like I was a horrible musician because I couldn't play this piece of music or interpret it perfectly. And um, I was more interested in uh, music of the Impressionist era and also composing music of my own. But because my teachers weren't necessarily interested in that, um, they wanted to focus more on what it was that I, I couldn't do so well. And that made me, that made me want to quit. So you know, as teachers, we have to remind, we have to, we have to remember that each student is really coming to you, asking you, what am I, what am I good at? Can you find it for me and help me do it even better? That's maximize that's how, it, maximize the gift. Yeah, yeah. That's how I approach my entire teaching career now is just help yeah. them maximize the gift, help them find out what that is. And, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of people try to quit music is because no one's ever told them that they're good at it. Everyone is good mm -hmm. at music. Everyone is good at music. Everyone can sing. Everyone can be musical. Everyone can do something of value in music. Um, we just sort of sometimes put music in a box. So I guess that's my answer. How's that? I love that because that answer right there, Mark, can take people into business or whatever. I know a lot of people listening to the show are business-minded entrepreneurs as well. 
And that's, you know, I've heard Gary Vaynerchuk talk about that a lot is the society, whether it's teachers, I'm not trying to pick on teachers in the school system right now, but genu- genuinely, it kind of starts there um, where you, you see the, the problem with a kid or something that maybe they're not so good in math. They're great in five subjects and math isn't one of them. So the, all they get talked to about is math, this, math, that, math, this. And like, they're really, really good in music, but they don't get either praise for it or it doesn't seem to carry weight, even though they're naturally gifted over there. But for some reason, the only thing their parents ever talk about, the principal talks about, their teachers talk about are the one problem. And of course, they want to improve on that. So they're not always behind in a particular subject. But it ends up like everyone's focus, like the horse blinders go there. Here's what I want to do. I, I was planning on getting into this a lot sooner. I like this, the way the conversation's going right now. I want to get to the single. Everybody's waiting to hear this. Some people haven't heard it yet because it just came out. Brand spanking new right here. It's called Just Fine. Tell me a little bit about writing the song, how you um, worked with a director, which is really an exciting process. You got Sarah Rogers on this, Hayden Fogel. Who else would you like to give a shout out to and just talk about writing this song? Well, if you don't mind, I want to rewind a few years. So, you know, Mike Bellacchino, right? Yeah. Okay. So Mike Bellacchino is uh, not only a, a fantastic musician, but he's my best friend. He was the best man in my wedding. I was the best man in his wedding. Uh, we've known each other for 30 years. Much love to Mike, by the way, if he's tuning in right now. I haven't seen him in a few years. What's interesting, real quick, Mark, I didn't know back in high school that he, Mike had that talent. He he was very humble about it. If he was, you know, gifted well, in that's, music, you just I had no him idea. Perfect. No, yep. No clue that he was uh, really, really talented in music. He kind of just was very chill about that. That's that's Mike. Well, it was about about thirteen years ago, and and Mike basically said. You know, Mark, you, you've got a lot of ability. Um, you know how to put a song together. There's there's nothing you can't do except um, finish anything. And he was the guy who, he's the checklist guy. You know, he's the spreadsheet guy. Um, and he said, I want to I wanna help you do that. So he started, he basically picked up the guitar, taught himself. Actually, he, he, he started playing the guitar significantly before that. But about 13 years ago, he decided, well, I'm going to start writing. And you don't have to, but I'm going to do it. So he started writing and um, started showing me bits and pieces of songs and basically fooled me into helping him finish finish them. Um, and uh, that began a, a – a, well, it was a relationship that was always based upon you know goofing around – uh, riding our bikes when we were kids, going on, uh, going on little road trips together. Um, and then suddenly it became a musical relationship, you know, uh, years and years and years into it. Um, so we've written scores of songs together and, uh, in 2012, uh, this particular song that just came out just fine. Um, we sat down and wrote it really quickly over the course of a weekend. He was in town and, uh, it quickly was forgotten. And, um, I don't know if you have this issue, but every time I get in my car, my, uh, my phone automatically connects to the Bluetooth in the car. And I would say like three out of every 10 times I got in the car, the demo for just fine would autoplay. And, I just start, I ignored it because it was just over and over. And then one day I'm, I'm sitting in a parking lot and I hear it come on and Mike's in town and I look at him and I go, I still love this song. I cannot believe that after all these years, I still love this song. And I think you and you and I are the only two people who have ever heard it. Um, fast forward to 2018 and I'm playing a gig with uh, Sarah Rogers and I don't really know her that well. and she's to the right of me and I'm literally just watching her sing. And I've never heard a voice like this. I've heard some good singers, but I've never heard a voice with that particular timbre. And I pulled her aside after the show and said, Hey, great, great job tonight. Um, I have a song for you. And I don't know if, I don't know if she knew exactly what I meant, but I was, you know, I had to remind her a few times, like, I'm serious. I, I have a song for you and you have to sing it. Nobody else can sing it 
it's perfect for your voice. And she's like, okay, let me know. And yeah. uh, so, you know. Did she know you up to that point? Were you just a guy that came up after the show? Or were you playing together, you mean? We were, yeah, we were on stage together. Oh, with, okay. Uh, so with, so uh, it wasn't that yeah. awkward of a, it was like he came up, I got a song for you. And she's like, okay, talk to you. I'm going to make you guy? a star. No. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, we, yeah, yeah. We were we were both playing in a show that was being hosted by uh, Courtney Costanzo, another local uh, vocalist who's very uh, cool. Just an absolutely ridiculous and um, and versatile singer. But um, you know, Sarah and I recorded the song during during the lockdown, and um, when we had the free time to do it, and. Um, throughout the entire process of mixing the song, we actually never saw each other in person. We did the whole thing over the phone, you know, virtually. Um, she did a phenomenal job. And then, um, that, that's, that's the story of the single, uh, which obviously you, you can, you can find it anywhere, Spotify on, you know, wintry theory. We'll get into all that, but, um, I did some film scoring work for a director out of, uh, out of Spain. And I thought to myself, you know, I really like his work. I like the cinematic nature of it. I, I, I like that it looks more like a movie than it does a music video. And mm -hmm. I, I pitched the idea to him. What if, what if, uh, you produced a music video of mine? He was down with the idea. Um, we flew him into Buffalo. Um, yeah which was you know, not something I thought I'd ever do, but I, I, I made the decision, Mike and I both made the decision at the very start, like, you know what? This song resurrected itself after eight years. Um, we might as well make a music video out of it. It's a let's persistent do it right. little like, song. We're going to yeah, do, do it finally. Right. We're finally doing it after eight years. Let's do it right. And you manifested this, by the way, just so you know whether you realize that or not. I do believe in that. You were, you were manifest, like in your head, you heard it already kind of the final version before all of this came together? Well, that is actually true. I'm not the kind of person who typically uses the word manifest, but I might start using it. So like, uh, you know, when I, when I, when I, when I do a project, I know at the beginning whether or not it's going to work or not. And 95% of the time I'm right. And that's not, that's not to say that I think everything I do is going to be a success. Um, but I do know very early on, that yeah, this is worth pursuing because I can see the end already, and if I can see the end, that's enough of a motivation for me to keep going even when nobody else believes in it. But if I don't believe in it, um, oftentimes I stick around too long and work on something that I don't think has the legs. But this 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 video, um, it's a beautiful, beautiful video. All right, so we're going to play a little bit. This is Just Fine, brand new single from Mark Marinaccio, Sarah Rogers, Mike Bellacchino, and friends, Hayden Fogel, throwing my shout-outs. Uh, guys, enjoy. We'll be right back. All right, Mark, I love it, man. What a beautiful song. And you, you nailed it with, like you said, with Sarah, her vocals on that track. Um, so tell us, you, you had a little story you wanted to share. And then, of course, give a shout out to everybody that made that video happen, that song happen. Yeah, I, I first of all, uh, all those sounds you heard coming together, um, I just wanted to mention all the personnel involved. So obviously the song was written by myself and Michael Balacchino. Um, we are we are each one half of of Wintry Theory, uh, the production team. Um, Sarah Rogers is the female vocal on the song. The guitars are played by uh, Mike Balacchino and Hayden Fogel, mostly Hayden, um, who is a uh, a local Buffalo-based 
uh, mostly blues guitarist, but I mean, he does, he could do anything. And, um, he's one of the few people in town who I knew was going to be able to deliver on what I, what I needed in this song. And, um, that solo that he plays was, is just perfectly tasteful. Uh, it was mixed by Justin Rose, mastered by Anthony Casuccio, who also mastered the B. Arthur album <laughs> about 15 years ago. So I remember that. Yep, going back to the B. Arthur. Did you guys well. play a um, a ball drop, Buffalo ball drop for like New Year's party? Oh God, yeah, yeah. New Year's oh five oh six. We did. Yeah. That's, that's a long. Time I think ago that's now. that's about when that album. You guys are promoting that. Yeah, it, it would have album. Yeah, the album came out a few months after that. Um, yeah. I did want to mention one thing about the the video, and and, and I'll you know shout out some of the people in a minute. But um, you got to remember, going into this music video, once we got on set, I realized this is um, I've never done this, and Sarah said she had never done anything like that, or maybe not much like that. Um, but because we were surrounded by professionals who had, they put us at ease and, you know, encouraged us that we, we could indeed act and be emotive and expressive. Um, fortunately there's, you know, as you, as you saw, there wasn't any dialogue, so that made it a lot easier. But, um, the song is about, um, it's a post breakup song. Okay. It's, it's, um, it's not just a typical run of the mill breakup song. Oh, I'm hurting. Oh, I hate you. It's, it's more of a, it's, it's a much more unique, um, nuanced situation. It's about that very specific thing we've all experienced where you see the person after you're no longer together and you pretend to be okay. And you don't pretend to be okay. You pretend to be just fine. Hello. Well, (laughs) <laughs> right, so that's that's where that's where the title comes right. from. Right, when people when you say, "Hey, how you doing?" I'm I'm fine. You know, it's that kind of thing. It's like I'm yeah, I'm fine. Exactly. But really, but, how many people say I'm fine and actually mean it? Um, th- probably not many. To <laughs> not be honest too many. with you, it reminds me of that meme real quick. Like you know the sports meme that like when a team's doing really horrible, there's like it's like a dog in a room that's on fire or something, and he says, <laughs> yeah. "It says I'm he's fine." Sit- and it's like, he's sitting on the recliner. It'd be like the Sabres. Yeah. They lost like eight in a row. And it's like, I'm fine. You know? All right. Anyway, back to no, the song. I, I know what you mean. Um, but that's the feeling. You see someone and yeah. you got to act, you got to act like you're kind of above it, but it's okay to hurt. Like, so you're feeling, you're still feeling this hurt and uh, you're trying to say like, I'm fine. I'm fine. But yeah, not and, quite. And, and both, you know, characters in the song are, are singing past each other. They are um, very judge. They're both judgmental characters who are telling the other, um, what to do. And if you just do what I ask you to do, everything in this relationship would have worked. Everything could still work if you just changed, if you just did what I'm telling you to do. And they're both doing it to each other and past each other. And um, it's just, you know, in re- at the end of the day, it's it's a, it's just a sad song. It's a, it's a song about totally just missing each other by like that much and never really... Um, you know, fixing the actual problems that we have in our own lives. But um, the, the, thing, the story I wanted to tell you, it's just really short, was on the first, yeah, the first night of shooting, um, there was a scene where the director, Manolo Campos, um, of Film Storms, he, he was setting up the lights and he was in, introducing the haze into the room. And he asked Sarah to get into character. And I was sitting on the edge of a bed. It's one of the very first scenes in the in the in the movie or in the video. And Sarah sat there for I don't know. It, might, it felt like a half an hour. It probably wasn't that long. And she made herself cry. And it was so convincing that I actually felt bad. Like I felt bad for writing the song. Yeah. And like you felt like and, you broke up with her or something. Bro- yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I know that's so weird, but she was, again, so convincing that I was yeah. just like, I almost wanted to end the shot. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but we're, but we're just characters in a song, you know? Yeah. That's um, awesome. so I, all of that to say she was, uh, an absolute joy to work with. Um, mm. she looked like she had done it a thousand times. Um, and that encouraged me to really step into the whole 
acting thing, which is, um, you know, which I have yeah. a limited history in. So I'm glad you did this, man. It's one of those things. I, I know how many songs, I can't tell you how many hit songs I feel like I have where I'm banging on the steering wheel and I never write it down because I'm not able to go to a keyboard and write it and then say, hey, Mark, why don't we collab on this thing? Vo- um, voice memos. So, uh, voice memos, I got plenty of those that only a handful of people can hear. <laughs> You're one of them. I actually, <laughs> funny enough, backstory, Mark and I got coffee recently and I played one of them for him and he, you didn't mock me out. You thought it was decent. Um, <laughs> he's like, yeah. No, nobody wants to listen to it. No. Uh, here's a scoop, though. You're talking about how you how you did this after eight years. It doesn't always have to be that that long, of course. Do you have, I know it's a single, but do you have a whole album that you're putting together with Mike Balacchino? And, um, and so, why not? Because you guys are so good that we all want more. How do we get so more the, music the short, from you guys? The short answer is kind of. The longer answer is um, one of the, and a lot of musicians, artists, filmmakers can relate to this. Um, one of the things that got in my way for several years was crippling perfectionism. Um, also I had these, these goals that were incredibly big, um, which usually looked a lot like this. Okay. I'm going to record an album. How long is that going to take? And in the meantime, will everyone forget that I exist and that I play the piano and I sing and I write? And the answer is yes, they will. They absolutely will forget you exist. And after a while, I forgot I existed because there was nothing, um, nothing to look forward to. It's it's when you decide I'm gonna I'm gonna make a project that could take several years to complete. There are no little victories along the way. So we decided we were going to release singles and that we were going to. Uh, seek opportunities to collaborate with with other artists. Um, I've heard. I, I look. I love performing. I've heard enough of my own voice for for a lifetime. That doesn't mean I'm not going to do anything else. But um, the stuff I've been doing over the last year with various artists is some of the most um, rewarding stuff I've done. So yeah, probably we'll compile that into some kind of album soon but right now we're just having fun putting out a song every few months i think it's a selfish on you know we all want more music from you guys because it's it's really incredible what you guys the talent that you bring and the diversity of, of the music that you guys create in, uh, and and the whole world well. wants more of this from you i appreciate you saying that man. yeah so thank congrats you so much. on uh 100 plus episodes by the way yeah thank you very much i will say um with talking about the single I'm yeah. just thinking about it as you were mentioning it. We live in a society now, culture. The single is what, you know, it's the hit anyways, right? It's you, you kind of know people now from their one hit that you've heard or whatever. It's very rare, like because of the download and we live in the streaming, you know, hey, Google, play this, right? And then it'll, how many people's Googles just woke up and started listening to me right now when I said that. <laughs> uh, I intentionally used Google because I don't have one in this room. But my point is you say, play the song, you go to the song, you know? And so um, not saying it would be a waste to do a whole album because that would be a beautiful thing. And every song on there would be, like you said, I know you're a perfectionist um, when it comes to music in a good way, but also can be a little crippling. Uh, I I think it's cool that at least you're releasing the singles and eventually they can compile into like an EP or a full length. But um by all means, it's like, you know, you guys have a have the time to put a single together and you and Mike are both working on so many different things. It's cool that you do come together. I was going to also ask um, if you plan on doing anything uh, together, like a performance with Mike when he's in town or anything like that. Um, haven't ruled that out. Um, yeah. I will I will admit that, uh, you know, recently we've both been um, trying to get kind of behind the mixing board more than out in front. Um, and we've been really enjoying it. So, um, I would say the chances are less likely now than they were a few years ago, but of course, you know, with all the stuff we're recording, uh, we intend on performing it live. And uh, some people are tuning in, meeting you for the first time. It could be people who've listened to the other Hi. episodes and and Hi. welcome, guys. Uh, this is Mark Barnacho. And but the thing is, like, you're kind of playing it low key right now, which I I understand, and I think you're being genuine about it. But at the same time, guys, don't be fooled. Mark, he's a performer. He's a live performer. He plays all the time. 
Uh, he's fantastic. So, um, you know, you might not hear him play this music live, but you have your kind of your solo project that you do live. You've also, Mm -hmm. you mentioned B Arthur, which is like a bunch of college friends that were all freak talents at their own instruments that all came together, made like a little power group, um, that you guys, it was like, you know, jazzy dance funk octet, right? It's kind of how you just describe that. You got party at nine. Party yep. of Nine is a fam- family band that plays, uh, you know, like corporate gigs and weddings and all that. So you, you were doing that. Um, and then what am I forgetting? I remember this uh, a couple of years ago. It was at Hotel Henry, which anyone that's tuning in from Buffalo knows what that is. It's actually like an old psych center that was turned into a hotel. I don't think the hotel exists anymore, though. Is that true? Did that not work I, I out? Think, I think COVID maybe. Probably, yeah. I don't. But, I hope that that's not permanent. Yeah. I hope it's not permanent because it was really interesting how they turned Psych Ward into a hotel. So it's already kind of this, got this creepy it's than, atmosphere. It's better than it sounds. It is better than it sounds. Especially for the who's brunch. Not, who's not, um, uh, you know, hasn't seen it. It's like this incredible building. It's right across from where I went to college at Buffalo State. And um, what's neat about this place is like you were up, I think it was, how many floors are there? Three, four, maybe? Maybe even yeah, more than that? four, maybe. And you're up on like the top level, if I recall, and you're in like this ballroom and you're playing jazz. And I was there with family and we, uh, I was just so happy to come and see you play. And you're doing this, you have this jazz band of, again, no surprise, just incredible talent that you're playing with. And you're doing Beatles songs covers in a way that I've never heard them played before. Um, and I just, you know, it's amazing to see the diversity. Like you can be that wedding band that's just playing all the hits and sounds exactly like the originals to freestyle jazz that's like intentionally out there and more spacious to like what you did what we just heard you with your single that's like Mm -hmm. more pop um so you know are are you intentional about that like as far as trying to really press on you know all these different uh, genres or is this is that just kind of natural for you uh i think that's just a natural outgrowth of being a fan of really all types of music Mm -hmm. um and I really mean all types of music. So uh, I like a challenge. And when somebody pitches a weird idea, um, I'm, I like to say, why not? And that actually, that I've done some things that were that, that were kind of my baby. But that Beatles jazz thing was actually a Russ Carreri, Matt Harris uh, thing. Two, two local sax players who are both absolute animals on their instrument um and uh both huge beatles fans and they they actually asked me to come and join them on that gig so yeah that was a when i was preparing for this interview i was actually thinking about that mark i'm like is that was that a dream or did that really happen because it was like it was a couple years ago now and i remember it vividly but part of me is like that could have also been a dream because it was so weird the way that it was like the beatles jazz hotel henry just converted from a psych ward it it sounds like a dream doesn't it It sounds like mark you were in my dream and this is where we were it sounds like a music it sounds like a gig in buffalo that's what it sounds like (laughs) (laughs) buffalonians will will definitely understand that um that said there's so much talent here it's um i remember when i was playing in my early, I started my first, my first gig ever was on my 18th birthday. And then I played until I was about 27, different bars and clubs all over Buffalo. And every time we played, it didn't matter if there were three people or a thousand people at like a festival, the other bands we played with were all, they all had something to offer. There was this really good talent, different styles, different genres. The gigs I least liked playing were usually battle of the bands. Cause you'd have like your collection come in and like, we got a root for you. And then whoosh, they'd pick up and leave. And the next band would play and like their 30 family friends would come in. Uh, it was usually the gigs where we were playing and meeting a new band uh, that always just were like the most memorable and fun. Cause we were like in it together, you know, sometimes we'd even have guys sit in and be like, Hey dude, why don't you like keep your drum kit up? We want to play another. I think just... when, mu- I think when music gets turned into sort of a competition, Mm-hmm there's a certain just magic that disappears. You know, I, when I was yeah. younger, I did a couple battles of the band battle, battle of the bands. Is that the yeah. plural battles yeah. of the bands? And, uh, <laughs> I hated them. I'm not gonna right. lie. I, you know, it's yeah. so 
There we you go. You know what it's like? It's that. like it's like going into an art gallery and there's like the ten artists that have brand new art going in, and then it's like, okay, everybody, uh, mark ten, ten being the greatest. Everybody, go put your number up next to the piece of art while the artists are all standing there. Yeah. Nobody would do that. It would be asinine to do that. But we do it with music for some reason. Well, because it makes the yeah. bar some pretty good money. Right. Yeah. You yeah, get that's... get more people in there, and like it's usually by ticket sales and. Yeah, I remember we came in like second place. We we got to like the third round of this. It was totally a money money making machine. It was like from Europe. It came to the states, and it was we played like three rounds, and in the last round we lost to a, a band that I'm not going to say the name of them, but um, it was like some crazy name, and it had like a devil on the logo, like stabbing someone or whatever. It was some crazy thing, and the grandmother was there, like go, yeah, and she's wearing the t-shirt, and I'm like. <laughs> I'm like, at least we, I mean, we lost because they brought their entire family, including grandma here with like this satanic t-shirt and, uh, okay, I guess we'll, we'll take it, you know, good job. Good job. We're on yeah. to the next show, you know? Um, but, I wish uh, I was yeah, there to so, see that. yeah, uh, it was actually at the Trelf, which is one of my favorite clubs in, in Buffalo. Mm-hmm. Um, so we talked about Mike Balakino. Shout out to him. You mentioned that you're going to continue to make music, but probably not doing much live. Obviously, we're on the opposite ends of the country. Well, let me, let me correct. Let me correct that a little bit. I mean, I, I, I have a full calendar. Let's put it that way. Um, right. I am not necessary. I'm very blessed because I'm not looking for for gigs. They just, you know, once you clear you, you clear your calendar, and it will fill up. Um, if you if you have any competence whatsoever, you you you'll work. You'll work in in any town, really. Um, I honestly sometimes I look at my calendar and I go, I need some time to produce. I need some time to arrange, and I I, I can't. And I don't. I can't see a, a single free moment for two weeks that I can do that because it's just filled with gigs. Oftentimes a lot of solo things and and stuff like that. But I, I, I ideally what I want to be doing is 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 producing these artists um, and promoting them and get, getting out there and give, you know, helping provide talented vocalists with, with their signature song. So that's, that's really what Wintry Theory is about currently. Well, I got some ideas that are on here that maybe I can pitch you and maybe we can have you and Mike put, make them make sense <laughs> at some point. Let's, that'd, let's that'd do be super it. Cool. I'd be um, honored. I'd love to hear this too, because I love, music composition um you probably heard me talk about my uncle Vinny before and you know growing up uh with you back in high school and stuff when he was kind of breaking into working in film and he's behind the board actually mixing the large orchestras that are playing you know like a couple of the movies that he's worked on were the new star wars reboots and like planet of the apes and even star trek um and, and just some really incredible movies and um quick story with him when I went to go visit him and I think it was 2008 I was in college going to visit a friend out there as well that was like doing an internship in LA and I go to you know I just land my uncle's picking me up from the airport I thought we we're going to go back to his house and he was going to show me his neighborhood or whatever his neck of the woods and he takes me directly from the airport to Sony and we go in the Sony st- sound stage and we're literally in the room where they recorded the original score for Star Wars John Williams 1977 we're in i'm in that room and they were working on a movie with like billy bob thornton and he was up on the screen and they were doing some tweaks to the sound treatment but uh, he was like yeah this is this is the room where that all happened which is really really cool to see so i have a love for it john williams is i have favorite bands like the chili peppers and led zeppelin and early 90s grunge i can name a bunch but then there's like this different category of with john williams like those compositions that he put together are a character in each film and without it the films easily are you know diminished in value in my opinion at least other people hey that's that's my opinion but tell me how you're like when did you fall in love with doing music uh, composition and what do you love most about doing that now composition um i can actually answer that question i fall in love with composing when i was about seven years old which is a weird thing to fall in love with at seven. It seemed like a very natural progression for me. Once I started playing the piano, um, I wanted to learn to play other songs that I had heard before, but 
I wanted to create things that didn't exist yet. And the idea that I could be walking down the street and humming it, humming a tune, and I could put this on paper, and somebody else could play something I wrote, or I could uh, um, be humming that same tune and some t- and put lyrics to it and record it, um, either digitally or analog, and distribute it blew my mind. I wanted to be the person making, making the stuff. Um, and when I got to college, it, it was one of those things where I sort of turned into a chameleon where, wherever I went. So if I was playing with a bunch of, uh, um, music students, you know, at SUNY Fredonia, um, and, and these, these guys were uh, diverse backgrounds. You had classical jazz, rock, funk, um, all kinds of different people. Naturally, I wrote for them. I wrote for their talents, um, um, to their preferences, and also to impress them. I, literally, that's the that's the only. I, I've learned that the biggest reason I write is to impress um, the musicians. <laughs> I just I love seeing their smiles. Um, but because I was also in a classically uh, cl- uh, being classically trained at Fredonia, I also then began to write music in the style of like the Romantic period. So I would write large scale piano works um, instead of doing the work I should have been doing, the work I had been assigned by my teachers. Um, by the time by the time I had graduated for my uh, senior recital, I, I played you know Debussy and Beethoven and Scriabin, and I also played. Um, you know, Chopin and, uh, I also played my, my original stuff, uh, you know, and it, you know, I, I, w- I would never suggest that my music fit right in with all those great names, but, um, one of the greatest compliments I ever got, and I was just about to stop writing because no one ever noticed, no one ever cared, um, was uh, people started to come see B. Arthur shows. That was one of the big things. Um, and they said that the music was different. You know, it was not like anything they had heard before. And, I, you know, that really uh, that really filled me with hope. And then Refresh actually, my memory. Th- those were original songs, correct? You guys were an original oh, band? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we obviously played other, we played covers and things like that too. But, you know, we had yeah. enough material to fill three albums at the time we, we all split It was off, you, right? your cousin Rocco, right? Was Devin... Yep. Flint on drums in that group. Devin Devin Flint, who is like a he's, Swiss, he's Army, an animal. Swiss Army knife. He can do it. He's, he can, he's yeah. an animal of a musician. Like I've seen when I actually came to see B. Arthur. I think you guys are playing O'Neill's across from the Buffalo Bills Stadium. This is a memory I have. And he was playing. You guys were covering. I think you were playing Cashmere by Zeppelin, and he was just like he played it perfectly. I was like, that's you know, you don't hear too many people cover. John he wouldn't Bonham uh, and actually play. He actually yeah. played it correctly. He wouldn't. He wouldn't attempt it if it wasn't perfect. Uh, that band yeah. also had uh, Kevin Urso in it on guitar. Urso, we had yeah. A, we had a Scott four piece. Uh, well, no, he was in a in a different band we were in. But uh, uh, B. Arthur had a four piece horn section um, consisting of uh, Dave Jakimiak, who lives up in uh, Maine um, now, and then three three local saxophonists: Justin Carreri, uh, Steve Galbo, and Tim Martin, who who all are doing something you know, with music in their lives. Um, but the other thing I was going to say real quick about falling in love with music is I had a, a teacher who, uh, he wasn't my teacher for very long. He taught like an elective at the, at the college, but he asked me to do two things. He said, can you play one of your compositions at this, at this recital? And I'm, someone actually wants me to do this. So I did. Um, and afterwards, he, I won't say who the other composer was. It's somebody who uh, teaches at a college, um, or used to teach at a college uh, in another state. And he said that um, that last piece you heard was by Mark Marinaccio. And I just have to say, I felt it really outshone the piece that preceded it. And I thought he was joking. And afterwards, he said, "No, I'm I'm serious. This is you should do this." And he was the first, I swear to God, was the first person, and I'm 21 years old, who told me, hey, you're not bad at this. Not one teacher um, that I ever had, you know, said, 
uh, you know, you really have you really have what it takes to to create music. Um, and that's all. All it took was one person. And then he offered me a hundred dollars and said, "Can you commission? Uh, can I commission a piece for you to write?" And you know, at that age, I'm, I would I would have done a lot of things for a hundred dollars. So, um, so I did. I, I wrote the piece, and um, he didn't end up playing it, but he ended up uh, delegating it to one of his uh, uh, horn students who played it at a senior recital. So, by the time I had graduated, three compositions of mine had been performed at. Um, at recitals, uh, right, right next to, you know, great pieces by household name composers. And, and, and anyone who's, um, tuning in that isn't too familiar maybe with Fredonia, but in that, in our neck of the woods, and certainly even in the Northeast, it's a school that people go there. They seek it out to go and perform music, or there's a lot of people that go right. there to learn sound engineering. So it's a prestigious mm -hmm. music school Mark's talking about. And there's a professor there who saw something in him. And it was that little spark that lit. It was a life moment, man. Those There's those moments in yeah. life where it really sparks you into something that um, now has you doing things at a different confidence level because of that moment. Right. And I, I, I feel like I'm doing a disservice here by not mentioning his name. His name was yeah. Ray, Ray Stewart. And, and Ray Stewart. You know, anybody who knows Ray Stewart knows that he, 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 he probably doesn't even remember that interaction, but... Um, but uh, it encouraged me like, you know, nothing anybody else said to me in the four plus years I was there. So yeah. thanks, Ray. <laughs> there you go, man. That's so important. And now you're a music teacher who, you know, I'm, are, do you see yourself now uh, inspired by that to, to, you know, not overkill it? Like every kid you see, they do something right and you got to tell them because that's not genuine. But um do you feel like, Hey man, you know, I know as a teacher, I can really, I can really inspire some kids. And does that give you like goosebumps excitement to be able to do well, that? Of course. If I wasn't excited to do that, you know, for, for children there, I wouldn't have been teaching this long. You have, you have to love it. Um, yeah. How long but, have you been teaching now? About 15 years? A little bit more. <laughs> um, so, uh, that's you know, amazing, uh, by the way. That's really like that's awesome. Yeah, any school that has a band, a chorus, or an orchestra is is very fortunate. But for a variety of reasons, I won't get into. You know, some kids never get involved in that. It could be money. It could be they weren't encouraged. It it could have just been too hard. Um, and uh, you know what what I what I've done in the last couple of years is create a um, a music production class for middle schoolers, uh, in which they write, um, uh, they, they write melodies, lyrics. Um, I teach them how to, you know, uh, beat making, a uh, little bit of mixing, a little bit of product promotion. And at the end of the semester, they release a song at the age of 13, 14 years old. And it's like, it's an unbelievable thrill to them. I mean, when I was that age, if someone would have said in this class, we're going to write a song and put it out into the world, I would have, I think my head would have exploded. Um, so I love giving that to the kids and, and you'll find that, it, you know, they don't all love it. Some of them are like, can I just do the album cover? Yes, you can. Others are like, can I do the promotion? Absolutely. What about me? Can I, can I just, I just want to be the beat making, but I don't actually want to hear my voice on the, fine there's something that you love and something that you're good at. I'm going to encourage you to do that. Um, like we said earlier, where you're not saying no, if you just want to do the cover art, we're going to throw you on vocals until we, you know, um, basically, you know, put you in such an uncomfortable spot that you never want to do anything. again. Yeah, I mean, yeah, right, this, so, it's a little counterintuitive yeah. what I'm saying, but like, if you're the music teacher, that doesn't mean that every kid in your classroom has to succeed by doing music. They're good. You know, yeah. they, they might, That's they might figure out what it is that they love through you and it might be something adjacent to music. And that's, that's fine with me. So, mm -hmm. yeah, they yeah. could learn something from their music teacher that teaches them a life lesson later on that they appreciate. And I know that's happened with me with teachers that are not 
music teachers that taught me things that have hit home in different ways as well. So I think that's super powerful. I know uh, I want to be mindful of time. We're going to have a couple more questions. I want to pick your brain on a few things. And I also didn't want to get to the end of this interview and not mention a couple people here. Emily Rodriguez, Ali Critelli, who's a friend of mine, and also uh, shoes on mic'd up. So shout out to Ali. Uh, Alex MacArthur, and then help me out, Jaden. Cor- say it. Uh, for yeah, Jaden. Jaden Coronado. These are all. Uh, these are all uh, local uh, vocalists who uh, Mike and I, uh, as Wintry Theory, are collaborating with, uh, writing for. Um, if you just mention their name, that means that they all have a song that is in production now. That's so, why I said it. Yeah, because I know we talked about new music and you're already got some stuff up your sleeve here. Yeah, absolutely. And um, mm-hmm. it's it's getting to a point now where, you know, uh, several years ago we, we were we were cold calling people saying, hey, I think I have a song that works for you. And, and they were like, oh, who are you? Um, and now it's a point where I'm getting, you know, inbox, um, I'm getting, you know, DM and people are saying, hey, uh, I think I'm a really good singer and, and they're finally realizing what I'm realizing is, you know, you can, you can sing cover songs until you're blue in the face and that's fun. If that's what you want to do, great. But there's a lot of young singers who are realizing that I want a song that is my song that when, when people hear it, they go, Oh, that is, you know, Emily's song or Ali's song or Alex's song or whatever. Um, and I want to help people do that. So, I'm, you know, now I'm getting people reaching out and saying that and um, and looking for our service is what we do. I'm so excited for that. That's You're like opening doors for people that feel like they're kind of stuck because it takes a lot. It's not just writing the song, but to have people perform it the way that's going to do it justice. Because that could be the other part of it. Like when you go to write a song, if you're not able to play all the parts really well, that can discourage you from ever even trying to record it because you know that it's not going to be, it'll be like a, this is a lack of better term, but like a bastardized, ver- bastardized version of it if it's not done right. And you're saying, we're going to help you do it right. We're going to produce it correctly in the studio and layer it correctly. And then you're going to be the star of your song. Exactly. And I'm having people, you know, inquiring who are saying exactly that, you know, I'm stuck. Uh, all the names you just mentioned, there is not one person on that list who's stuck in their music career. That's that's for sure. Um, Alex is doing everything. Um, uh, freak talent. Um, you know, Allie is a songwriter herself. Um, obviously, like you know her. Um, and Emily and Jaden are, are, you know, I they're pretty much voting age, and they've accomplished more than most people uh, I know. So. Um, Naturally, I want to I want to be around people who are uh, uh, that motivated. The talent comes together. We see like entrepreneurs. We always say like like minded people come together. We do mastermind groups because we want to have that energy. We want to be around people who not only see and dream big, but we also are the action takers, and that excites mm-hmm. us. We love hearing about like other people breaking through barriers, and we want to do it ourselves. And with musicians, I feel it's the same way. Like. You guys all have this drive, this this musical talent, but you love getting together because it's like everybody brings each other up. And you're also on the same level of understanding music, appreciating it, and then being able to deliver. Because you could love music, but you know, not everybody's gonna deliver it to be able to record on that album with you guys. And yes. everybody we just mentioned is like they do their part and everyone's like, Holy smokes, and Ali does her part and you're like, Phew. you know. Right. <laughs> like, and, and and honestly, you know, the prerequisite is, is, is talent, but you know, really what's the most important thing is everybody you just mentioned, everybody that's been involved with, um, you know, just fine, the single and the video, these are people who don't just talk about their ideas. They're like, let's put something on the calendar. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, everyone should surround themselves with people like that. Um, Hey, Mike Bellacchino, he said, Mark, you, you get, you create mm -hmm. Beautiful ideas. You need to finish your beautiful ideas, and he was and, able and, to help yeah, you. Yeah, and them. and shut up about them, and just <laughs> just do just do them. So yeah. yeah, he's a huge he's a huge reason why I'm productive at all, and my wife is the other reason that I'm productive. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, shout out to Sasha. She's awesome. I love seeing her like 
whenever you're playing out, she'll share the post and you could tell that she's a proud wife, just like loving on her husband. And that makes me so happy to see it. Like she, she loves that you're a musician and there's something to that. Uh, and, uh, I think you guys are like the perfect fit. I just get happy every time I see you guys doing cool stuff together. So shout out to her. Um, I know we're going over. I'm the producer of the show. We can go over. There's nobody telling me we got to cut to another commercial break. We, I didn't even run an. I didn't even run the social chameleon ad. It's clickable, guys. If you want more information on social chameleon, go go check it out. It's our podcast produce uh, production distribution company that I'm running. Um, so you guys can check out more information there. But I want to also talk about how you you have this kind of side project passion that you're doing where you're recoloring old, old photos, and it's super cool. Um, oh yeah, I, I didn't even think I didn't think you'd bring that up, but okay. Let's do it. I I think it's, there. I mean, I didn't even know, like the photos that you're recolorizing, what, what is it called? Is it recolorize? Is Recolor, that the right term? Recolorization, sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I thought the photos were taken in black and white, so they didn't have any color, but you're actually pulling out colors in them and it's like, it's amazing quality. So what uh, does that look like? How, do, how are you doing that? We are really switching gears here. So uh, let me just give you some background here. So like, um, what Mike is talking about here is, um, actually taking photographs from pre 1950, oftentimes going back into the late 1800s and digitally recolorizing them. Now, why would a music producer, uh, and composer have an interest in this? And, um, uh, honestly, it was one of those things that just, I don't even know. I, I don't even know. Why. So I kind of know. So like I was, um, years ago, my uncle, it's actually the same uncle who taught me piano growing up. He got me interested in, um, genealogy and, um, and, uh, long story short, that got me, you know, involved in learning a lot about my own family history, especially going back to, you know, Italy. I visited some of the places my family was from, I came into uh, a wealth of um, old family photos and I just thought, how cool would it be if these things were in color? I saw a, a, a tutorial video and I got really interested in it and, and kind of got lost in it for a couple months and uh, didn't really show anybody. And then I posted a few of them and then I started getting emails and requests. Hey, can I pay you to do this? It's like, uh, yeah. You, it's basically self-taught though, where you were learning how to do this or you were like watching these videos and learning how to do it. Yeah, it actually, I mean, it, it came pretty, it came pretty quick. I mean, once you just kind of learn the, the basics of, um, of, you know, skin tone and, and the fact that, you know, I mean, it, it may, it may, may not be obvious looking at this, uh, pale moon face right now, <laughs> but, but no skin is not just peach. It's got reds and blues and browns and all different shades in it and, and blacks and whites. It's, um, and you know, it's, a, it's a lot about shading. It's, you know, so is it actually, you're adding, you're adding color. So in a sense, you're like an artist behind that piece. It's not really like stripping away the black and white and there's color underneath it. It's, I don't even know. No, 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 no. I'm talking about, these are, these are photos taken prior to color film. So we're talking. Right. So you're adding color that it wasn't there before. So if someone has a blue shirt right. on, we don't know if they had a blue shirt. We, on. We your, don't know, your, but that it often requires a little bit of research um mm. into figuring out you know maybe they're wearing a military uniform and you research yeah. a vintage uniform a lot of times you do have to guess uh, one of the things i do uh, i never do is suggest that what i'm what i'm coloring is is 100 accurate because you can't always know mm. um and it's not uh it's not necessarily authentic either so i, I kind of give that disclaimer anybody who recolor recolorizes photos should should probably give the disclaimer that this is not what this person looked like, but this gives mm. you a better a better idea. But if you're doing like Babe Ruth, for example, which I think would be a really cool one for you to do, um, you know, you know, kind of the jersey tone, his color, like you can you can get it pretty close, most likely. The greens of the grass, if there's a if there's Yankee Stadium behind him, you can have some fun with that. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's yeah. that's really weird you mentioned that because that is one <laughs> of the ones that I'm working on. He's got to have a, a stogie in his mouth too. Wouldn't I think great. I think it's I think it's him. It's him in his post post playing career, and he's meeting. I think he's meeting like George Bush forty one. Like I'm wow. talking like 
oh, in wow. the 40s, like right before he died. Yeah. So, so something, yeah, it's kind of one of those weird that is cool. times in history where like two figures met. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I wasn't expected to get asked about that. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, again, I, it's, it, it all stems from just a love of art, um, a knack for seeing what's missing in a photo. Like it's the same thing with arranging. And um, I love being in a room and just, you know, with a bunch of musicians and just being quiet and observing and um, sort of being the glue that holds the band together. Not that the band can't hold itself together on its own, but knowing not necessarily like this is my part and I'm going to force it upon you, but knowing exactly what to play to kind of glue the drums, the bass, the guitar, the vocals together. And same thing happens with the visual arts. You know, I love graphic design. Um, and I, I also love, you know, you know, the other thing too, with, with the, with the genealogy thing is, um, I've had uh, many, many, many instances where I've, um, such, such a weird like turn here, but, um, like I've reunited adoptees with their biological parents and things like that. It's wow. just the opportunity was there and I had the information and I couldn't, you know, refrain from helping. And in a lot of those cases, mm-hmm. I, uh, I have a photo somewhere in this room where I, I, I helped a, a woman who's in her 60s identify who her biological father was, and as a as a gift, <laughs> without my permission, um, she sent she sent me a photo, like that was this an old framed photo of her great great grandmother from 1910. I don't know what to do with it, but yeah. she sent she sent it to me as a thank you because she was just so you know. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. cool, man. So I don't. I guess I don't just do music. So there you go. No, 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 no. And even if you did, that's it's never just uh, just anything. I hate the word just. It's limiting, right? All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to bring the ship back in. We're on the DeLorean. We went back in time before high school. We talk a little high school. We talk about your playing now. Um, I want to know two things, and then we're going to let everybody get on with the rest of their day here. Um, you've played so many cool venues as well. You just recently did a show where you were playing. Uh, you guys were all even – looking like the band queen uh, and i wish i could have been there but i i know you guys killed it that night um you've done some really cool stuff i'm i'm gonna say something right now and i want you to answer what's the first thing that comes to your mind but the gig that gave you the most goosebumps where you're like wow this is really happening right now what's the one gig that comes to mind where you're just blown away that you were had that opportunity so it has Honestly, it might it might surprise you. It doesn't have anything to do with really like uh, an incredibly large opportunity or a big name or anything like that. Um, the mm-hmm. biggest thrill for me, um, you know, growing up being somebody in the Western New York area who attended Thursday at the Square, I know it's not even the biggest venue but um when, when it's I, still when pretty people, big though what did they get about ten thousand people maybe maybe yeah i mean um yeah. at, when b arthur was together to be able to um open up for uh big bad voodoo daddy which you know um you know they, they were pretty big for a while you know we opened up for them and um to be able to be on stage in front of a built-in audience of thousands of people and to play only music that you wrote um and some of your bandmates wrote is um it's i don't know it's hard to explain you know some people say like you know, hitting a home run is the greatest thrill or or I, I don't know what what kind of things people say but for me it's it's writing something that didn't exist yesterday bringing it to life and never and then not knowing how to imagine a world in which it didn't exist it's it's just a it's just a weird thing, but yeah, uh, we played we played that back in I think two thousand six. And um, have I played gigs to bigger audiences? Have I played more lucrative gigs? Of course, but um, I always go back to that one. There's also another one more. I think about two thousand sixteen, I put together an original group called uh, Mark Marinacci on Friends, and uh, that gig consisted of a six piece horn section and a killer rhythm section, and we played a gig at uh, Pausa on wadsworth street i was there yeah. i think and i think you played there a couple times though but i was i was uh, at one of them yeah i did a couple times and that was sort of a, a comeback for me because it was uh earlier that year i realized i have to play my music i have i have to play my music 
I love I love doing all the other stuff, but if it's out of balance and I'm not creating something new, I get I get a little like I get a little uh, annoyed. So uh so that gig, I just remember uh one of my aunts coming up to me at the at <laughs> Yeah, it's. I make it sound like the audience is just filled with my relatives, but it, no. It, but it's it's going to have you know any gig I play in this area is going to have um, a sizable amount of my relatives there because that's just the kind of supportive people they are. But one of my aunts come up to me and she grabbed me and she looks right at my face and she goes, "You need to do more of this." And nobody ever pulls me aside and says, "You know, you need to play more uh, more covers." More Stevie uh, Wonder or something like, but uh, well, it's not. Play, play more of your own. Yeah, but when but more to, originals, but to, yeah. But to hear that was encouragement that yeah, I'm doing I'm doing the right thing. I need to get back to this. Mm-hmm. So I didn't just I didn't go anywhere. I didn't disappear. I just wasn't in balance. Uh, so sure. now I am, and I'm doing more of my own stuff, and uh, I can't wait to sh- to keep sharing it over the next year plus. Yeah. And so we're going to wrap up with this, Mark, and I appreciate you opening up and sharing the backstories behind your song, the, the new single, um, you know, and your musical. It's really been an adventure, like the different things that you've been a part of, also being a teacher um, and and just the different ways that you, you've you contributed to music as a whole. Uh, and I, I want you to reflect back on this and don't need, maybe, you know, do it now, but once we're done with the interview and just think, you know, how, you, you've been blessed in many ways to do a lot of cool things, and uh, but at the same time, you're the one who 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 did them. And I know you're not looking for the pat on your back, but realize that uh, you've had a special music career up to this point, and you continue to build on it. And it's just a really really cool thing for me to see as a friend from afar, and also be able to be in those moments with you. Um, I'd love to play with you sometime too. We can maybe make that happen. But uh, it's just really really cool to to see where where you've come back from. Uh, middle school or high school jazz band or whenever we first got together marching band it might have been but uh last question for you ready for it yep you are the author and protagonist in your own life story so i want you to put yourself in this scenario author and protagonist in your own life story you get to write the ending and god willing you live a long and prosperous life you're looking back on it you're reflecting on it and you get to define your legacy what would that be You should have let me know this question was coming. No, no. Um, um, can I answer that in about 30 seconds? I, I just, I just, I just, yeah. I just wanted, um, I just wanted to just mention some of the people who helped make just find the music video. Um, if, if I, cause I don't want to leave any of them out cause they were all so unbelievably supportive and gave me one of the most exciting weekends of my life. But the director was Manolo Campos. A producer was my cousin, Alan Trinka. Um, we had um, uh, Rebecca Mansell as a, producti- a production assistant. Her brother, Adam Mansell, was doing lights, and he was also an executive producer. Obviously, myself and Mike. Um, Sarah, again, singer. Uh, we had Hayden Fogel and Mike Bellacchino on guitar. It was mixed by Justin Rose, mastered by Anthony Casuccio. We had Valentina Semino and Megan Norris doing makeup and still photography by uh, Raul Marrero and Shauna Stanley. So, yeah, I just... I couldn't uh, couldn't leave them out. Um, God, I hope I didn't leave anybody out. But uh, I probably did. But um, anyway, uh, to answer your question, see, I was buying time there. Yeah. Um, r- phrase the question one more time, please. I'm sorry. So imagine that you're writing your own story, right? And and you get to there's empty pages right now. Oh, what's what's my legacy? Yeah. So you get to write what that is. And and the cool thing is, I want everybody who's listening to this to realize that. God willing, you get to do that too. If you have your health and you you got, you can you can move forward. I want everybody to think about writing their legacy. But what, what's that look like for you, Mark? If if uh, someone's looking back at your whole story, what's that? Legacy? I don't. I mean, I I it's a tough question to answer. I'll just I'll just speak on a couple of things that have made me feel vindicated or validated in my life and. Um, you don't always know it at the time, but I, I, I had a previous job I worked at for 10 years, and the last few years, they were very strange. There are a lot of individuals who, for whatever reason, and I never figured out what these reasons were, but I have my ideas, 
just stopped speaking to me. Um, and when I, when it, when it was confirmed that I was going to be leaving that job and getting a different one, several different people, and I mean more than I can count on one hand, would stop me during that last week. And they said, hey, hey, Mark, I know we haven't talked in a while, but the way you handled yourself in the last three or four or five years, all things considered, and I won't get into any of the details, they said was really, really inspiring to me. And I don't know how you did it, but you always came in here with, with your head held high and you, and you did what was right for the people around you. And it's like, man, if somebody would have said that to me at the time, you know, it would have made some of those rough days a little bit easier. But hearing it years later, I'll take that. I'll take it. Um, I, I just, uh, I guess, I, I guess I say that as an encouragement to people who feel like maybe we don't always know how people are thinking around us, right? No, and, no, we don't. Know, but everybody's watch. Everybody's watching, and mm-hmm. you don't realize that uh, when you feel worthless or you feel like, um, like uh, to use a twenty first century term, you feel like you don't have a following. You do. Everyone is. Somebody's watching you. Somebody's inspired by you. Someone is looking to you uh, for guidance and. You're you're always helping somebody. That's 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 the uh, that's the other thing I was going to say. And and one one other thing too, um, I think I'm starting to see what my legacy is a little bit. Um, for those who know me, you know that uh, several years ago we had uh, we had some personal tragedies happen. Um, some of which I, I I won't talk about here. But an- another one was we our house burned down, and uh, that's not something I wish on anybody. Uh, it's very, very um, disruptive, and it's something that lasts, which was, uh, the effects last for many years because even, you know, here we are three plus years later, and every every once in a while I'll remember, oh, I should go find the, um, oh, wait, I lost that in the fire. And you don't even, you, for years it, it continues. Um, and um, my house burned on a Friday, and I had to leave work. And uh, fortunately for me, the next day, it was my brother's wedding. And that, you know, everyone was felt so bad for me. And they were saying, oh, my God, Mark. I said, I said, chill. I'm having a good day. You know, my brother's wedding is happening today. I'm actually going to use this to ignore the stuff going on in my personal life. And it worked. It worked. It's not like I never had to deal with it. But I didn't, I didn't have that initial shock and depression. I ended up going back to work on Monday. And when I walked in with my lunch pail, people were, <laughs> I heard audible gasps from my coworkers like, what are you, what are you doing here? And I just, and I remember answering to some of them, well, what else am I going to do? I can't sit on my, you know, I can't just sit at home on my couch, which of course is a joke because we didn't have a house or a couch, but I just went back to work and just kept doing my job and being me and, and, you know, being joyful around people and it made it a lot less terrible. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, you still had yourself, you had yourself, you had your wife and you had your, your brain and you had your heart. So you were able to still function and control your mind. And then you're also, we're, we're making sure you were being there for your brother. It's his big day. Yeah. Stop the drama. You're telling people like, Hey, let's, let's, this is a good day. And then also you're, you kind of taught yourself in that moment, like, we can choose to have good days. A lot of well, that is actually more on us than we think it is, right? Yes, and that's that's the whole point. I I, almost, I don't feel like I even got to the point, but yeah, I, I was being selfish. I was literally like, I'm not going to think about this. I'm not going to think about it. And by the time the weekend was over, um, even though there was still all the work was still to be done, I realized that I accidentally had chosen to be happy, and that it works. Um. It's a thing you have to choose sometimes, you know, every day, every morning, or you have, sometimes you have to, it's a fight. You have to choose minute by minute that today I'm, just, or, you know, this minute I am going to, I'm going to win. I'm going to overcome. And, um, that's some of the most, it's just meant it's mental toughness, but it's, it's also a gift. You know, it's a gift from God. It's not, you know, um, you know, some people, some people are good at it. And I had to learn the hard way. <laughs> Let's put it that way. But you well, can choose. I talk about this plenty of times on the show, whether it's divorce, business failing, loss of a loved one. Um, 
we never say like, man, Mark, I'm glad you, your house burned down because that taught you a great lesson. You're like, well, you know, right. to be honest with you, if I could choose, I wouldn't have had it happen. Of but course. the fact is one thing we couldn't, we're not able to do is change an event. You're not able to go back into DeLorean again and say, we're not going to have that. However, the house fire started, start. It happened. And then now you choose how you react to it. And you either are Debbie Downer for the X amount of years it takes for a rebuild and all the insurance paperwork and the adjuster to come out and phone calls and the mental distraught. Like, yeah, if you let that dictate your happiness, it totally can. It could totally take you down. But you realized in a way it kind of happened for you then because it improved your self-think. And now you're using it in ways that are you brought you just brought it up on this podcast because now we're trying to help more people so they can realize, hey, don't let your house burn down for you to learn this lesson. Mark's already did, and he's teaching us <laughs> through that moment. And uh, everybody has their house moment. It's just different things in life that come at us that we we never wish we experienced. But when you're not able to change it, the only thing you can do is change how you react to it. Right. You ask yourself, what is the lesson that I'm being taught here? Yeah. And then or I can learn from it. Yeah. Jump into that lesson as quick as possible. Well, this I'm glad this conversation went in a different direction as it did because you're not someone who's Mark, and as I said earlier, I hate the word just, but just the piano player or the composer or the artist that put out the new song. Uh, there's so much more to you. And I feel like we could go another hour and a half and still have interesting things to talk about. But um, is there any last words you want to say before uh, we get everybody off to the, the rest of their day here? Well, I guess I'll just, I guess I'll just plug the music real quick. Um, yeah, do uh, it. Well, number one, let's, uh, let's get together soon again. I just wanted to explain what Wintry Theory is. So Wintry Theory is a collaboration between Michael Balacchino and myself. We're a production team. We write, we produce, we procure talent. Um, we, we find something uh, we find what's going to make you sound the best. So think about it this way. Think, imagine you're a model and you're looking to wear somebody's clothes. Um, you find a designer. Um, we're looking to write a song that you can wear that fits, that fits you. Um, and, you know, like we mentioned earlier, we've already got, you know, uh, probably at least five or six things in the works right now. So much we can barely stay on top of all of it, but we're looking to do more and I love collaborating with people. And, uh, Oh, by the way, one other thing, uh, you mentioned, you made three DeLorean references at yes, least sir. in the yeah. same interview. Um, that is my dream car. So if anybody is out there, I mean, where's the camera? If anybody's <laughs> out there and you're selling a DeLorean contact, don't con don't contact Mike. Cause I don't want him to have it. Contact me because from the ages of, three to 12 michael j fox was my was my idol <laughs> yeah marty mcfly so. was he was the coolest dude man he was a hero mm -hmm. he was like not the a per perfect protagonist no. in a movie he was awesome yeah not a john williams score though it wasn't but it you know but at the same time that one it worked the you know the power what is it power of love or what Huey was the song? Yeah. yeah uh it works for that movie you know, oh, and Zeme Zeme Zemeckis was great, and he had um, it was the two Bobs. It was Robert Zemeckis and who Bob was Bob Gale. Bob Gale, Bob, yeah. Bob Gale, Alan Silvestri. They, yeah. yeah, beautiful. That that the part one and two are my favorite. Part three, you know, got a little off there, but um, that and just like is... that, it turned into a nerd podcast. Just like that. <laughs> no, I don't care what anybody thinks. It's not. I'm not even going to use the word guilty pleasure. Back to the Future is the greatest. I don't think I've ever met a single human time. being that Back to the Future comes up and they're like, that movie is no good. Like <laughs> everybody loves Back to the Future. It's not a I don't want to know that person. Yeah, I don't think yeah. they exist. Uh, not on this in this uh, planet. So this is amazing. I had so much fun. Thank you for being here. Keep doing what you do. Uh, you, you don't realize how many people um, you're inspiring. It's your, your students. It's the people in the audiences that are watching you perform. And thinking, you know what, I, I'm going to go dust off that keyboard and I'm going to start playing again or sing or whatever it might be. So uh, keep doing what you're doing. And I'm glad that I got to shine some light on your story because uh, there's just so much that's going on that um, when you're in the moment, you don't always appreciate it. So mm -hmm. that's it. We're well, just but. celebrating. We're celebrating Thanksgiving. And I want to say 
two things. Be great. Be grateful. Thanks so much, Mark. Thanks, Mike. I'd like to give a huge shout out to everyone for tuning in, especially those who listen all the way to the end to hear this message. Seriously, I appreciate you and my guests do as well. Giving a quick reminder to subscribe to this show. It's completely free and will allow you to receive notifications when new episodes are released. If you'd like to provide a tip as a gift, you can do so via patreon.com backslash mic'd up. It's spelled M-I-K-E-D up. Patreon.com backslash mic'd up. You can give as little as $1 per month or as much as you'd like. Every dollar is greatly appreciated and completely unexpected. Appreciate your reviews and your messages coming in on social as well keep them coming your feedback is valuable and absolutely means the world to me you can check out more episodes and content at mikeduppodcast.com we're powered by social chameleon you can also follow me on instagram that's where i'm the most active and it's at mike dichocho m-i-k-e-d-i-c-i-o-c-c-i-o thank you so much for your continued support you guys know what to do be great and be grateful 